Before I read the lecture, I have a map here which, which shows where we're talking about in England. It is the far northwest of England, about 80 kilometers south of the Scottish border. I shall say nasty things about the Scots, but I did have a Scottish grandfather, so I won't be too unkind. This will only take a moment. You will see that the North the England has the Pennine Hills, just like the Italian Apennines, they are the backbone of England. You see this in the brown patch on the map. That there is the famous Lake District. And to the right, the Yorkshire Dales. And we are talking about the Yorkshire Dales. Thank you. We will start in just a moment on the formal lecture. But this is a map of the Yorkshire Dales or the North West Dales. For those of you who are geologists, it is of great importance because it is where the Great Dent is that on? That the Great Dent Fault runs through the mountains there, like that. And it means that these hills belong to the Lake District and are much older than these hills, which are of much later limestone. So the geology is very complex. It is a glaciated landscape and then it is incised with deep rivers. We are talking mainly about Dent Dale here and also the valley of the Rothi. They run into the River Loon which discharges at Lancaster into the North Sea. Pendragon Castle is in Malastang. The River Eden flows north to enter the sea 200 miles north of Lancaster. And here is the famous Wensley Dale, which you will know some of you from our famous English cheese, and that flows to, I've been talking about the North, I mean the Irish Sea just now, flow east to the Irish Sea, flow west to the Irish Sea, and Wensleydale flows east to the North Sea. I tell my grandsons that if they could find the right place, they could empty a bucket of water facing one direction, and it would enter the sea near Lancaster, south of the Lake District, walk a mile or two, pour another bucket, it will come out on the borders of Scotland in the Solway Firth, empty another bucket, and it will come out 
far to the east in the North Sea. So we're at the top of the catchment. I shall now read my lecture, but it is a great joy and privilege to be in Spain. A hundred years ago, my grandfather traveled throughout Spain with his uncle recording the details of Spanish churches. So there are many lovely English churches with beautiful iron screens derived from Spanish churches. So my family has a great deal to be grateful to you for. My lecture. A stitch in time saves nine. If I have a small hole in my jersey, I should mend it quickly, or it becomes a very big hole. The people of Dentdale were famous knitters of the fine, strong wool. They made the jerseys for Nelson's Navy. So they knew all about a stitch in time saves nine. And William Morris says, you need to care for your buildings by daily care. Then you don't need to restore them. In 1930, a 10-year-old boy was walking through the ancient town of Shrewsbury, famous in the Welsh border for its beautiful timber-framed buildings. He was walking with his father and noticed that a fine building, Rowley's Mansion, was to be demolished. He expressed dismay, and his father advised him to write, explaining his views to the secretary of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, Mr. A. R. Powis. He did write to Mr. Powis, who refused to make any changes to the letter, apart from one or two points of punctuation. The letter went to Shrewsbury Council and to the owner of the building, and the building was saved. If you walk through the old streets of Shrewsbury today, you will see that much of Rowley's mansion still stands, a tribute to a 10-year-old schoolboy. Raven Franklin was an unusual boy. Born high in the hills of Westmoreland, he was building dry stone walls at the age of seven and laying stone slates to barn roofs by the time he was ten. At school, he found any excuse not to play games so that he could cycle home early to feed animals and repair the barns and walls. His family was a blend of science and farming, a combination which proved invaluable in life. His father, Edward, came from a long line of distinguished chemists. Uh, they had all trained, incidentally, in Germany. Painted excellent watercolors of farm, farms and their buildings, and wrote historical novels, many of which were based on the legends of King Arthur. Raven's mother, Maud, was born into an able family of landowners and farmers in Westmoreland. I should stress that when you talk about landowners in the hills, you are talking about people who have been yeoman farmers themselves for many generations, but have four or five farms which they've had for many generations and a few tenants. Nobody lives in a big, big house 
with a park and smart gates. At one time, the family also had mining interests, which I think explains his entrepreneurial skill. Raven had two younger siblings, Helga, who farmed the family farm during the war and became a distinguished earth scientist and rode her pony to the top of the highest fell every day until she was 88. And Noble, who is still alive, who, after flying Lancasters in the Second World War, became the official historian for Bomber Command and then director of the Imperial War Museum. I'm only telling you this because it explains why Raven had such a rational and pragmatic approach to the management of his historic estate. It was underpinned by discipline, intellectual discipline, a keen understanding of farming, and a profound sense that there should be principle in the methods of farming and management and their application. Just a moment, I'm just going to get back onto the PowerPoint so that it reads through with the lecture. Be there in a moment. Sorry, everything's going wrong from there. <laughs> right. It's key to go back. It's all right. Okay, one. Okay. Yes, no, there we are. Sorry. I live in the hills and I have a drawing board and a pencil and a fountain pen. That's my trouble. I'm just going to move those on every few moments. That gives you an idea of the setting of the farms in the landscape. From the age of 18 and until his death 60 years later, Raven Franklin farmed and developed an estate which grew to 10 small hill farms, 10 further houses and cottages, and a number of other fine buildings, including a water mill, a ruined Romanesque castle, and a listed telephone kiosk designed by Sir Giles Gilbert Scott of the type you see all over London, painted red. We have one sitting in the middle of a farmyard. Throughout those 60 years, he was a passionate member of the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings and was deeply influenced by its philosophy and repair methods. He would attend the annual general meetings and took a keen interest in the governance and financial management of the society. Each summer, a group of young society protection of ancient buildings, own scholars, there were usually four each year, usually architects, but among them engineers and surveyors, and equal numbers of ladies and gentlemen, visited Raven and his wife, Juliet, in the Cumbrian Hills. I was one of those guests in 1978. We worked for two weeks on repairing drinestone walls laying slate roofs on the buildings, dashing the walls where you flick the mortar, flick it onto the stone to give protection to the joints on exposed buildings, dashing the walls of field barns and consolidating the Romanesque remains of Pen Dragon Castle. After the founding of the SBAB's William Morris Craft Fellowship in the late 1980s, skilled craftsmen, another four each year, came to learn the vernacular building skills of the Northern Hills to complement 
They are very, very sophisticated still skills, perhaps as stone carvers, very clever iron blacksmiths, plasterers, conservators. So they, they've taken and spent two weeks with Raven, working with lumps of stone in the rain in the countryside, laying stone walls. The SBAB was founded in 1877 by William Morris and a group of artists, architects, and cultured laymen. It is a matter of interest to me that the SBAB has never had an exclusive professional, um, never been a an exclusive professional society, but has derived its energy and renewed passion from professional architects and laymen in equal measure. I know here that it isn't just architects here, but archaeologists, geologists, anthropologists, all sorts, and that is precisely what the SPAB is about. Nor has it been a club for old men. When I attended the scholars' reunion in September, I found, to my horror actually, that I was the oldest present, and the young were an equal balance of gifted young and not so young ladies and gentlemen. I only say this because it is immensely important in life to bridge the gap between many generations. The Manifesto. I must refer you all to the Society's Manifesto. Please look it up on the SPA's SPAB's website, and if there isn't a good translation in Spanish, uh, we must make sure that one is written. I'm not asking you to sign up to everything it says, but it is a challenging document. It is a challenging document, and we could all spend the entire conference arguing over every line. However, I find it inspirational, and I find it necessary to read it repeatedly to remind myself of our passion for handing on to new generations what we have inherited in a form that is not, in Morris's words, useless to study and chilling to enthusiasm. You look at a cathedral in England like Wells, and everything you see, less a few stones, is the work of the medieval masons, of individuals like each person in this room. You go to Litchfield, which was built of a poor stone, there's barely a stone left. You cannot see the hand of the medieval carver. Just to get us all fired up for energetic debate this evening and tomorrow, I quote several parts of the manifesto important to Raven Franklin's approach to his work. My favorite view of the estate. Restoration, if the present treatment of them, the great historic churches, castles, and country ha uh, cottages of England, if the present treatment of them be continued, our descendants will find them useless for study and chilling to enthusiasm. Isn't it wonderful that all the lectures over the past two days reveal that in Spain as in England there is such a rich inheritance and it's up to all of us in England and all of you in this room to make sure that it is that remains that way. Again, William Morris speaks. We think that these last 50 years for these great churches have done more for their destruction 
than all the foregoing centuries of revolution, violence, and contempt. I actually think that the huge and incredible prosperity now of England and no doubt Spain is an ent rather it is parallel to the problems in the mid 19th century in England. In other words, really there's too much money around to spend on buildings. That seems a hard thing when you're an architect trying to get any money at all, but it is a problem. Morris again. For all these buildings, we plead and call up those who have to deal with them to protect in the place of restoration, to stave off decay by daily care, to prop a perilous wall and mend a leaky roof. This and only then shall we escape the reproach of our leaving behind being turned into a snare to us. Extraordinary statement. Thus and only thus can we protect our ancient buildings and hand them down. Marvellous phrase coming up hand them down instructive and venerable to those who come after us. I have walked round the old houses of Cumbria with my grandchildren and with Fernando, Camilla and their children. And you are conscious of the immense responsibility When Natural England came to report on Raven Franklin's life achievement in their triannual reports, they repeatedly refer to the state estate's stitch in time approach. I have a copy of that report with me if anyone's interested in seeing it. The whole proverb reads a stitch in time saves nine. Anyone who has neglected a small hole in a woolen garment or sock, quite a peep, apart from being in trouble with your mother or your wife, knows the truth of this statement, as did the terrible knitters of Dent, who could knit so fast. Everyone knitted that they were the fastest knitters in, in England, if not in Europe. The late Alan Rome, a distinguished church architect, wrote a poem on the same principle. For the sake of a tile, the roof did rot. For the sake of a tile, the roof did rot. For the sake of the roof, the church did rot. For the sake of a tile, As I would drive across these lovely hills with the late Dr. Juliet Franklin, we'd pass a barn with a lovely roof on it, and she would put her nose up. That's mine. And then we'd pass another one, falling down. Nobody would bother to repair the roof. The roof had fallen in. The walls were falling out. That one belongs to one of Raven's cousins. Realized, Raven realized these principles throughout his estate. A small building team, Raven and three part-time men, worked around the 100 or so buildings of the Franklin family farms. I've calculated that if you add all of Raven's buildings 
to his sister Helga's buildings and his mother's buildings and various buildings they looked after for his cousins. It was about a hundred buildings to look after. They moved around, patching roofs, repairing and painting gutters and downpipes, repairing and painting doors and windows, clearing drains and repairing and improving the interiors of the houses for modern living. Raven prided himself on personally painting 100 windows each year. I have to say that I've looked at one or two of those windows and I think he was in a bit of a hurry to achieve his target. The whole range of buildings was attended to. Houses, barns, field barns, cottages, the mill, the telephone box, the lime kilns, alas, and also the ruins and boundary walls of Pendragon Castle. Around the farms, depending on the tenancy arrangements, walls were repaired by the farmers, who also laid hedges. The estate team attended to the woodlands, brashing, felling, and planting. For 60 years, Raven worked steadily on the improvement of houses, installing proper water supplies and drainage, introducing electricity, incidentally first supplied from our own water mill, then connected to the national grid, and now we're thinking of having it back from the water mill again. Kitchens and bathrooms, a lot of houses had none, were dramatically improved. Alas, the whole process now has to start again, as it's now 30, 50, 70 years ago that Raven did his work. When visitors came or he needed to work on something urgently, Pendragon Castle became the focus of attention. This is the ruin of a late 12th century castle. You'll see some images in a minute. It had a great hall and solar at first floor level, and was clearly built as a place for pleasure, as well as war. The Scots burnt it down several times. You don't ask Scots to dinner. They'll burn your house down as they leave. I shouldn't say that, should I? My mother's father was a Scot. In 1660, it was entirely repaired by a remarkable lady. Lady Anne Clifford, Countess of Pembroke, Countess of Montgomery, Countess of Westland. She left a diary of her happy days at Pendragon. She repaired six castles and as many churches. She built almshouses and was Westland's greatest benefactor. In many ways, she seems to have but had the heart of a member of the SPAB 300 years before it came into existence. Many of the houses have remarkable interiors. Rashmill Cottage, which is just up here, on, just above there, has a superb court cupboard, exquisitely carved. Raven wouldn't allow any old oak furniture to be sold from any of the houses. And I am now told by the National Trust that we have a better collection of houses with their original interiors intact than the National Trust does in the, Peak, the Lake District. So we're a bit proud of that. Hollin Hill has superb 17th century panelling in most rooms and excellent doors and hinges, latches and so forth. It has the finest staircase on the estate. It is the ambition of the new trustees, and this is important, and is absolutely in line with everything the speakers have been telling us about and over the last 36 hours, that we are going to undertake something never done before on the estate, and that is a fully measured survey of all the properties 
and a full historical assessment of each. I think I shall have to get Fernando to do the photographic side, don't you? The maintenance of farms. Incidentally, the house on the, house on the left is where we live now. Um, two weeks ago, we had 40 centimetres of water in 36 hours, rain, and it swept all around us, boulders and trees, and huge volumes of water came down the hill, but the ancient house builders knew how to build a platform for a house and knew how to organise the drainage. As millions of gallons of water poured down off the mountain, we were grateful for the farmers of all the old times. The maintenance of farms. Many of the Franklin's tenants had faced economic disaster in the 1930s and the early 1950s. Land-owning farmers selling up to Mr. Franklin became his tenants, and many, the Hunters, the Baineses, the Wolfs, are families who still farm many of the farms in these valleys. Mr. Franklin believed that hill farming families were hefted to the hills, understood them, and could make them a success. By changing, charging modest rents, he never made a financial loss. Because rents were kept low, farmers would be so determined to respond that they looked after their farms with excellent results. Raven encouraged traditional farming practices, grazing with both sheep and cattle and encouraging haymaking, which is essential to the well-being of the meadows. He discouraged and in many cases forbid the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Perhaps this was a consequence of being descended from three generations of chemists. The two estates, Helgers and Ravens, have for 60 years achieved the honor, advised by the Nature Conservancy and the Prince of Wales, that the farms at Ravenston Dale have the finest wildflower meadows in the whole of North of England, whole of the North of England, and in two, year 2000, they were numbered amongst the best 100 sites in the whole of Western Europe. That is a most extraordinary fact. Raven used to say it occurred by accident. When I told his sister that, she was really absolutely furious and said that it came out of good common sense and good sound judgment. Farming continues despite immense difficulties. The hardy sheep breeds are sought after far away on the lowland farms and all around the world because they are, have good, such, such good bloodlines. The wool, alas, is virtually worthless. If anyone in this room wants to make themselves a multi-billionaire, just think of something you can use wool for apart from making your jersey. That's my waterfall, of which I'm tremendously proud. Dr. Helga Franklin, who died at age 92 in January, told me that nothing was more important than the well-being of the families depending on the estate. In hard times, the Franklin family, with their greater financial resources, invested in the local families. As a consequence, the farming families are still there, living in the old houses, working the farms, caring for the sheep and cattle, and the rare hefted flocks. Those are the ancestral flocks that live on the top of the hill and know their roots around the landscape. These are vigorous, intelligent families. And for every one young person you meet who decides to farm, there is a sibling who finds their way energetically into the wider world beyond. These are vigorous people. 
the estate has also sustained many of the local building traditions. These craftspeople are exemplars in their work for others living in the National Park, achieving high standards of work encouraged by the National Park Authority. Raven's principled but pragmatic and economically minded approach to his estate lies rooted in his upbringing and the inspirational attitudes and outlook for the of the SBAB. I do not think that Raven ever sat contemplating Morris's utopian ideals, but he did understand farming. Natural England in their report has complemented the estate. We're talking about a way of life. We are talking about a way of life. I have noted in a similar way my trained SBAB friends flourish in unexpected ways in a modern world, and I think this is good things to hear for architects involved with ancient buildings. They are skilled with their hands. They are inspired by craftsmen, ancient and modern. They have the versatility and imagination to travel to all parts of the world solving incredible problems. They are skilled at noticing what is around them and combining local knowledge and skill with the best of new science and technology. Surely this is the kind of versatile professional craftsman or layman that lives life in the Morris and SBAB tradition. The future offers many challenges and I know I must stop in a couple of minutes, but essentially my family and I are in the extraordinary position of having inherited this extraordinary estate and without those huge financial resources we have to find the ways of ensuring that the principles are maintained and that the estate survives. Why? Because if we sold up the farmers would have to sell up to rich businessmen they would end up living in the local town far from their farms and the valleys would cease to be what they are today. I'll just take you through a few views. These are just the water mill and the river, which is so, so beautiful. But last week was a raging inferno. You can't have a river which is an inferno, but you know what I mean. The sheep flourish and the houses are of extraordinary value and quality. Just a few images. This is one of Lady Anne Clifford's churches and then this wonderful castle, Pendragon. And what I would like to feel, ladies and gentlemen, is please come and visit. Come in one car with four of you, or two cars with eight of you, or just about manage sometimes three, but well. But please come. Get into the habit of coming every year. Getting to know us so that we can get to know you. I think that the inspiration of Morris is that we have things in our lives which are an inspiration in the modern world and they give you confidence, they give you vision, and they give you a sense of what the world can be. Why? Because you are doing it, knowing where we come from, knowing what craftsmen have done through the ages, knowing that we have confidence in craftsmanship, of building beautiful buildings, of making the world so beautiful, Remember a couple of things. Sir John Smith said to me, he was the founder of the Landmark Trust, John, why do people let their buildings disappear? They disappear because they become unusable or unloved. So an architect has the challenge of breathing new life like Francesco did at the Villa Saracena. And remember too that if the building falls into disrepair, if you don't have three men like this, 
who have given more than 120 years of maintenance to that estate between the three of them. Thomas Barmer was awarded the MBE for the longest serving farm worker in Britain. <laughs> and finally, please come and see us. We will show you the most extraordinary thing of all, which is our castle. But above all, I'd like you to meet the farmers and look them straight in the eye and get them to teach you how to build a dry stone wall, walk in the beautiful woods, hear the roar of the waterfalls, and remind us that God made an extraordinary world. Or, if there is no God, well, goodness me, it is still the most beautiful world. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for asking me.